Number 1. Life Everlasting, 4th Quarter, 2022. John Pauline. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to start the class, Life Everlasting on Death, Dying, and the Future Hope. And lesson one is rebellion in a perfect universe. And Dr. John Pauline is our moderator. And Alf is going to offer our opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for Pinal. Thank you for all these people that meet together and want to learn more about you and to share the thoughts with people all around the world. We come before you asking for your blessings. Bless John Pauline that leads out and give him insight. Bless us all with your Holy Spirit so we will learn more about you, your character, and how we can reflect you in our life. All this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're starting a new series, and the series is entitled Life Everlasting. And I really puzzled as to exactly what this was about. This is not a biblical lesson. We've had lots of biblical lessons where you follow a book of the Bible, sort of chapter by chapter, and there it's fairly easy to know what you're doing. But in this particular case, life everlasting is a theme. And so I went to the introduction of the quarterly and examined fairly carefully to try to figure out what exactly the topic was. So if you'll pick up your handout, I'd like to work through first four or so as sort of building a big picture of what we're going to be doing in this quarter. So going to number one, reading there, it says, since the title, Life Everlasting, is a little ambiguous, I studied the introduction to the quarter's lessons at the beginning. The introduction was titled, On Death and Dying, Our Future Hope. This suggested a focus on death and resurrection. And for those who don't know, fundamental belief number 26 of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is entitled Death and Resurrection. So I thought perhaps that's the theme of the lesson. But then I read on, and I read as follows, that the purpose of the quarter's lesson was, the present biblical study guide deals with the subject of the great controversy between good and evil from the perspective of two major themes. One is the origin and ongoing existence of sin and death. The other theme is God's enduring work to solve these problems and bring the world back to its original perfect condition. But then it doesn't stop there. It says, special emphasis is given to the mortal nature of human beings and how the resurrection is what leads to immortality. Now, I don't know if that is perfectly clear as to exactly what the focus is, but I was struggling with that a bit. It suggested to me the lesson would focus on fundamental belief number eight of the Adventist church, the great controversy, but also fundamentals eight and nine on salvation. So it was looking like this lesson was going in a number of directions at the same time. Then the introduction concluded with the statement, this quarter we will explore the painful subject of death, but through the lens of the hope offered to us through Jesus. So this statement returned to the focus of the title, Death and Resurrection. Still a bit uncertain, though. I reviewed the 14 items in the table of contents. In other words, what are each of the 14 lessons in this quarter about? And they seem to follow a timeline beginning with the rebellion in heaven and ending with the new earth. So that great controversy idea seems to be the structure of the lesson, but there's also a focus on sin and human nature, which is fundamental belief number seven. So there I was after looking at the introduction, and I asked myself the question, given that information, uh, you know, what is the theme of the quarter? And I'm going to give it a shot here in number two. After some reflection... I concluded that the organizing principle of the quarter's lessons was the great controversy theme, something dear to the hearts of the Pinell community. But with that overarching theme in mind, the lesson pursues themes like human nature, fundamental seven, death and resurrection, fundamentals nine and 26. There's also some focus on end time events, fundamentals 25 through 28. 
So in a way, you get the impression that this is a fairly global study of uh, Seventh-day Adventist teachings. There's at least seven or eight fundamental beliefs that are touched on at least in one lesson. So I'd summarize the lesson theme as death and resurrection through the lens of a cosmic conflict approach. The running context then will be cosmic conflict, but the primary theme will be death and resurrection. All right, and I won't ask you to reflect on that now because you haven't had a chance to really study the thing through, but let's keep that in mind. Death and resurrection, human nature, great controversy theme, that seems to be where we're going. Number three, according to this week's lesson, the theme of the first week's study is the question, how did sin and evil appear in a perfect world? And we'll pursue that question in the rest of our study in this particular lesson one of the series. All right, number four, and we'll take a look here at an important text from Jesus. And then with number five, we'll start opening things up for your engagement and conversation. Number four, nature in its present condition offers a mixed message that mingles good and evil. How does one explain the coexistence of good and evil in our world? One option, philosophically, suggests that evil exists to enhance our appreciation of the good. In other words, if there wasn't evil, if there wasn't suffering, etc., we wouldn't really appreciate how good we have it. So that's one view of this mixed picture of nature. A second view is that evil is a disruption of a perfect plan. Jesus seems to address these possibilities in Matthew 13, verses 24 and 30. So let's take a look at that passage, and when we're done with this, offer a few thoughts on it. Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30. And by the way, uh, one reason I'm kind of rushing through the first four here is because this lesson went in a number of directions that we have 12. I think that's an all-time record for me. I don't know about Daniel, but I have 12 different question banks <laughs> for this lesson. And so most of them seemed important to touch on. So I'm sort of rushing through the first part here, and we'll have more time to discuss on the ones I think are more crucial. Terry, why don't you read verses 24 to 30 of Matthew 13, and then we'll go through the verses one at a time. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where? Then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my barn. I find it interesting that the author of the lesson where it's sort of doing a cosmic conflict approach from Genesis to Revelation would begin with Matthew 13. That's probably not where I would begin. I think, as you know, I usually begin with Ephesians 1. But this is intriguing because Jesus does seem to be touching on this big philosophical question. Why does nature give such a mixed picture? And Jesus' answer is obvious on a first reading. An enemy has done this. There is a hostile entity in the universe. And as a result, all the good that God projects is also countered to some degree by the activities of this enemy. So what I want to do here is fairly quickly go verse by verse because there's some depth in here that will help set a foundation and then I'm going to open it up. I'll just let you know ahead. Number five is a very, probably the briefest question bank I have ever introduced, and that is, what is love? 
So you can be thinking about that, and we'll be opening it up for discussion at that point. But first, Matthew 13, 24. Uh, Jesus told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Now, when scholars take a look at this kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, are fascinating concepts that one could spend a lot of time with. But it's basically saying, when Jesus repeatedly says, the kingdom of heaven is like, what is he saying? I think he's saying, this is what the government of God is like. God's rule works like this. And then you could go even a step further and simply say, God is like this. So I think Jesus' repeated introduction of parables with the kingdom of heaven is like is his way of saying, let's talk about the character of God. Let's talk about how God governs the earth, how God governs the universe. So the farmer in this analogy represents God. And the farmer doesn't sow any bad seed in the field. The farmer's purpose, the farmer's intention is for good and good things to happen. So the parable starts with that concept. Verse 25, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. All right, so this is an analogy of wheat and weeds. The farmer, he plants wheat, but the enemy plants weeds. The weeds are not natural. In this parable, the weeds are deliberately sowed by an enemy. So the idea that evil is natural in a universe in which there's freedom is not stated in this parable. But instead, the parable is saying that evil is an intrusion. It's not necessary in order to appreciate good. Evil is an enemy act. It is an act that does not have the best interests of the world or the universe at heart. All right, verses 26 and 27. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? And what we see here is that it takes time to separate the weeds and the wheat. It's not obvious at first that there is a problem. People often say, well, if there is a God and he is good, why does he allow things to drag on like this? Well, because it's not obvious. It's not clear who the enemy is. It's not clear why this conflict is taking place. And so the solution here suggested in the parable is to give it time. Verse 28, an enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? And he said, no, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. So the parable tells us here that ending evil too soon will cause irreparable harm, irrecoverable harm. Yes, the conflict has gone a long time, but it's because in God's judgment that there would be great harm in seeking to end it too soon. Whereas Second Peter tells us, God does not want anyone to be lost, but all to come to repentance. Verse 30, let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and burn them in bun put them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. So the destruction of evil then precedes eternal bliss. So the parable is a simple, analogical way of saying some very important things about the cosmic conflict, that God is not the author of evil, that there's an enemy about that does this, and that the conflict will not be easy to bring to an end. So anytime you get into the cosmic conflict, it becomes clear that love and its meaning become pretty central in all of this. And we're going to, with the help of the lesson author, look at a number of texts that talk about the love of God. But before we do that, love is such a slippery term. 
So the assignment I have for you now is to define love. And I'm not so certain that there's a right answer, as love is very complex and has a number of facets. So let's give it some thought together. How would you define love? What is the meaning of love, the English word love? How would you define it? All right, Rita, go ahead. Yeah, actually, I wanted to say something about this parable of the weeds. Please do. Because I think an important part here is while everyone was sleeping, the enemy came. That would imply that if it stayed awake and took note of what was happening, the enemy wouldn't have got in. And what do you draw from that? Because he's talking about the kingdom of God, that if you're awake, taking notice, taking notice of who Jesus is, because that's what he was there to do, he was living the kingdom of God, then you won't be overtaken. I like your thinking a whole lot, Rita. When the harvest is done, that because it's not until everything's ripe that you can really differentiate the one from the other. So you don't want any mistakes made, mm. which is what could happen. You know, when anybody who does any gardening, if you're sort of thinning seedlings and trying to get weeds out from seedlings, the danger is when you pull your weeds out that the seedlings you want to keep get pulled out as well. So you wait till they're a bit stronger. Both are a bit stronger so that you can easily identify and the ones that need to stay won't be disturbed. They will recognize the ones that do need to be pulled out. And then they're put into their bundles, not necessarily for the weeds to be burned and destroyed before the wheat brought into the barn. It says that the weeds are tied in bundles to be burned. So they're separated, put in a place where they will be burned and then gather the wheat. I don't think that the parable is saying that go and burn the weeds and then come and collect the wheat. Put the weeds to one side because they can't grow anymore, but they will be destroyed. All right. I appreciate careful reading of the passage and bringing out a number of dimensions there. The one caution I would offer is that scholars generally say the parables of Jesus usually have one main point, and what you make of the rest of it you can often make a lot of it, but perhaps with just a little bit more caution on some of the details. And that's for both of us. Okay, Ashley. So this is going back to you were asking about definitions of love. And it yeah. <laughs> reminded me of a C.S. Lewis quote that I came across. And it's actually on a sticker in my water bottles. It goes, love is not affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. Very good. Thank you. Michael? Well, there's different kinds of love. There's that intense emotional love that one spouse has for another, or when you're just first dating and then become engaged and so forth. There's love of country. There's love of one's profession and calling in life. So it varies. And of course, then there's the definition that Paul gave in Corinthians. You know, it's never angry and it's never unkind and so forth and so forth. But it is such a very complex concept to accurately define it. Excellent point. And there are truly, as you said, many options. Bobby Joe. So the parable that was presented, it seems like Jesus is saying from that parable that the enemy's strategy for introducing evil was through unseen and not obvious strategies. But he doesn't end there because he introduces immediately after that two more parables. One is about the mustard seed and the other one about the leavening. And it appears to me that he's saying that in God's attempt to strategically reverse this intrusion of evil into the perfect world, which he had created, that has to also come in very gradual, unseen not obvious manners. And I wonder if the meaning of love sits in that space of how it goes about being reversed. Okay. Yeah. Again, an extended meaning of the parable. And I think in the context of the whole scripture, the parable lends itself to a number of thoughts, as you and Rita have shared. What exactly Jesus had intended, it might be a bit less than that, but the parable sits in the canon now. So I think this kind of thinking is helpful. Bob? 
really quickly on the love part, I'd like to incorporate by reference what Ashley and Michael said. I think those are pretty good definitions of what love is, but I think long-term love as opposed to just a short, like when somebody goes on a date and really likes the other person, that's really short term. But a commitment that goes through life, for example, they're going to be ups and downs. It isn't just based on emotions. So I like what both of them said. On this wheat and tares part, I wanted to throw something out because this makes the assumption that from the beginning, if the wheat and the tares are people, which sometimes is assumed, I think, I don't think that's quite right because that assumes that the wheat cannot become tares or weeds and vice versa. And I think probably most of us are a mixture of wheat and weeds. And if you said that they stay the same through their whole life, in other words, whatever you start out at, you end up at. So if you're starting out as a weed, you stay a weed. Well, that's ignoring that God can convert you. So I guess my question is, is this talking about ideas or people? When I grew up and heard this in church school, I think I always had the impression the wheat and the tares are people. But I'm thinking that can't be right. Well, I think you illustrate exactly what I was cautioning about, Bob, and that is that if you try to make every detail of this parable work, you end up tied into a knot. And I don't think anybody would suggest, I think the idea that, you know, wheat and the tares could be people, okay, it's certainly a possible way of reading this, but obviously people aren't born tares and stay tares. At least that's not a perspective that the Seventh-day Adventist tradition has held sway, the idea that people are predetermined to be on one side or the other, and they cannot change. It's, it's designed into them. That's not the freedom impression that I think we find in most of the Bible. So, I think this is an example of maybe taking the parable too far. If one tries to press that, well, you know, you can't change between the two. Clearly in real world, there are people who repent and people who go astray. And so the parable doesn't cover those bases or doesn't attempt to at least. All right, Jim Testerman. Hi, Jim. This is obviously not a all-compassing definition of love, but it's an aspect that I think is worth considering in that when Jesus created humankind in his image, and we always talk about how he made the male and female and they become one, this is a form of love that is similar to, you know, the Godhead being one. And uh, Jesus said to his disciples that he was wishing for them that they would become one like he and his father are one. So this is a result of love. I mean, it's not the only result because we're not all of us married together as one, but nonetheless, we should function in the church, for instance, that we should become in a form of oneness as God is one. And it's tied together with the definition of love, but it's not the complete definition. Yeah, I think clearly when we're talking about love, this is a biblical writer's adjectives are, in a sense, analogies. When someone says love is blind, obviously it doesn't mean that love can't see, but there's an aspect of blindness that is an analogy for what love is like. When you say God is love, the love is an analogy an attempt to understand something crucial about the character of God, something absolutely central to the character of God. And the answer to that question can be complex because God is truly bigger than we are, and truly understanding God will require an eternity for finite creatures. However, Paul, I think, does narrow it down just a little bit. And I think uh, Ashley suggesting right at the beginning from C.S. Lewis comes pretty close to what I think Paul is defining. This is not 1 Corinthians 13. I think Paul there gives a more standard definition of love, a more practical definition of love in many senses that perhaps a non-Christian writer could have said a lot of those things as well. But there's a type of love that is truly Christian, a type of love that is different from what society portrays. And Paul gets into that in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 8. And what I would ask Terry to do is read the first two verses of Philippians 2 for now. Philippians 2 verses 1 and 2. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, 
being in full accord and of one mind. All right, so here Paul sets what he's doing here. The topic of this passage is love, and Paul's purpose in this passage is to define love in a new way, in a way that I think is uniquely Christian. And let's look at verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. All right. So here, Paul defines love, if you don't mind the word definition. He defines love as other-centeredness, that a person, as it says, is not working from selfish ambition, not self-centeredness or conceit, but considers others better than yourself. Look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So Paul here draws a contrast between self-centered and other-centered as being crucial to the unique perspective on love that comes in Jesus Christ. And he makes that clear in verse 5. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Okay, going back to the beginning of the chapter, he is encouraging believers to love each other in a particular way. And he goes on to share that it is to become more and more other-centered. Why would Paul pursue that type of love? Because it's exactly the perspective that was that of Jesus in verse 5. So Christ is the one who brought a new style of love, a new way of loving, a one that would be a clearer picture of what God's love is like than some of the simpler definitions that one might find scattered here and there, even in Scripture. But that at the heart of it is that the God of the universe created with the idea of the very best possible outcome for those who are being created. In other words, God loved and cared for his creation even before and as he was creating So notice how Jesus illustrates this other-centeredness, verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. All right. So this is Jesus in his divine state. Who he was as God is governed by this concept of other-centeredness. He didn't cling to his status. He didn't cling to his privileges. He didn't cling to his rights, even as God. But notice verses 7 and 8. But emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So we see that Christ here gave up his divinity, or at least the exercise of his divinity. That's a complicated question. And he entered into a life of service and obedience. His life became a model, if you will, of two things, what God is like, but also a model of what we can become. And Paul's whole point in introducing this story of Jesus coming down from heaven and becoming a servant and going to the cross All of that is being shown because Paul is saying, this is the kind of love that God wants us to have for each other. The kind that Jesus displayed for us first is the kind that he is inviting us to follow in himself. So the concept, and again, any term has its limitations, but other-centeredness, it seems to me, comes the closest that I've heard to defining love the way Paul does here and the way Jesus does in John chapter 13 and verses 34 and 35. John chapter 13 and verses 34 and 35. I give you a new commandment that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. 
So to love one another, the call is to love one another the way Christ has loved us. We saw that in Philippians 2, verses 6 to 8. In John, you will see it when Jesus goes to the cross. A love that set himself and his needs and interests aside for the sake of others when it was necessary to do so. He was willing to go all the way in other-centeredness. And he invites his disciples to love each other in the way that he has loved them. That becomes the mark of discipleship. The kind of love they show to each other represents the kind of love that Christ has loved them with. And whenever you see such love in practice in this life, it's a miracle, and it indicates that something deep is going on. Sherry? It seems to me that that kind of love is grown incrementally into our lives, and that it's a process. And I think often what keeps us from that kind of love is both fear. I'm fascinated how God or the angels, anytime there is contact with humanity, one of the first things that is said is, don't be afraid. And I think there's a reason for that, because fear can interrupt our ability, can kind of freeze us from participating in some kinds of thinking and behavior, just because it's self-protective. And so I think fear enters into that a lot. And I think what really helps us be able to have that love is the being loved. The more we are loved and we're secure, and we know that we're accepted fully, and we can accept ourselves even in our brokenness, we can know that it's all right, we're still growing, we're still learning, and God accepts us, we accept ourselves, then we can accept other people better also. But I think it's a process that happens incrementally as we travel with God. Absolutely. And I think something that was pointed out in a, another class that we did at one point was the idea of by beholding, we become changed. When one has a, a true picture of God and looks upon that, one becomes transformed more and more, as language Paul often uses, more and more. So the gradualism is definitely significant. But as the disciples behold Jesus, as in beholding Jesus, they behold the character of God, you become more and more like it. And that's the miracle. It isn't something that happens naturally to sinful human beings. Dan? I think that what Sherry is referring to is growth, which I think is a very important component of what you're talking about. And of course, the results of this, and you've alluded to that, is really becoming altruistic. And I think that that doesn't come necessarily naturally to many of us. The other thing I think that in a discussion like this, something that we don't talk enough about is what Alcoholic Anonymous talks a lot about, and that is the concept of tough love. The ability to say, if you develop this way, I think one of the very important concepts is when you're thinking about others is the ability to say no. I think so often people who think about love think they have to say yes about everything. But I think there are a lot of things that are quite damaging that people ask of us. So I think we really need to, when you think about other people and their needs and their need to grow, I think this component of thinking about the best for someone else frequently says no. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Uh, let's go on to number six. And in number six, there's another text. This is First John this time, rather than the Gospel of John. First John 4 and verses 7 and 8. And this is the classic text regarding the love of God. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. All right, so to know, to truly know God is to become a loving person, as we said, you know, gradually, developmentally, more and more. So what does this passage say about God? And if everything God does is an expression of love, how do the six types of wrath in the Bible fit in as expressions of love? I mean, God often speaks of the wrath of God. And how would one fit that in with the concept of other-centered, self-sacrificing love? 
one of those types of wrath is God taking responsibility for what others do. I remember somebody recently seeming rather offended by a presentation on cosmic conflict and saying, if God created us, and if God gave us freedom, then ultimately he's responsible for evil. You can't get around it. And the interesting thing is, you know, as I thought about that, scripture suggests God does take responsibility. And what the whole conflict is about is in taking on that responsibility. Is God worthy of our trust that he will see that through in the best possible way? I think that's one way in which even what the Bible sometimes calls the wrath of God is a way in which God is attempting to exercise this kind of love. When God takes responsibility, he is sharing in and saying, you know, I'm going to make this right in the end. When God gives people up to reap what they sow, how would that express God's love? Perhaps easier to answer when God acts to deliver his people. How does that express God's love? When God acts to restrain evil, like in the flood story, how would that be? an expression, an outflow of God's love. When God acts to get people's attention, as, for example, in the plagues of the Exodus, how would that be an expression of God's love, etc.? God's wrath is reactive to sin, but if his ultimate character is love, how would you suggest that God's actions, sometimes called wrath, how would they fit in? How would they be expressions of God's love? All right, Henry. It comes to my mind that the very fact that God is paying attention to the wicked, to the not so wicked, to the ones that are trying to follow, gives this importance because God, or love, I should say, love is unconditional. It's nothing that I just give to some. I will only pay attention to some. It's an action that will be given to everybody. And all of those reactions of God means he is intentional with everybody. He has not say, well, unless you behave this way, I will be paying attention to you. Oh, I like that very much. Thank you, Henry. That I think hits the nail very powerfully on the head. That God in every one of these is seeking the best possible outcome. Sometimes we don't permit the best possible outcome. But even when the Bible portrays God as doing things that are hard for us to fit in with the concept of love, an analogy that often helps is the analogy of parenthood. Parents are often doing actions that children might feel angry about or, or feel aren't appropriate, etc. But a truly loving parent does these actions for the sake of the child. Correcting a child is not fun for the child or for the parent. But sometimes it's necessary for the best possible outcome. Bob? Going back to when you started with number four, one of the things that was brought up there it said, one option is that evil exists to enhance our appreciation of the good. Okay, it seems like if somebody was going to argue that that's the case, that would mean that evil needs to exist forever. And if God says, no, I'm going to bring it to an end, then I think that suggests that that should come to an end. So I don't know if that is our philosophy in this class or that's generally Christianity's philosophy. I think it is, but I wasn't sure if that was something that is really a serious contention at this point in Christianity. Yeah, well, philosophically, that's been a subject of considerable discussion lately. And some might have heard of the movie called The Matrix, which is some 20 years or so ago. And the whole idea of the story was what would happen if machines became so smart that they would enslave the human race and would then put them into a dream state of having a life so that human beings think that they're living a meaningful life, when in actuality they are just unconscious and being exploited by these machines. So that was the basic idea. And the representative for the evil ones in the story said, you know, we started out giving human beings a perfect world you know, a heaven on earth. And everything was great. And it's as the human beings kept waking up because it just, it didn't work. It didn't fit right to them. They were not happy with that. So we had to introduce suffering and consequences and stuff like that. Then the human being stayed asleep and everything's fine. So that <laughs> philosophical idea triggered scholarly books. You wouldn't believe it uh, by the dozen scholarly books that were written on that theme that came out of that movie. 
I think in the secular world, this is a very popular concept right now, that the purpose of evil in the world is to make good look worthwhile, to make us appreciate the good that we have. And as you brought up, Bob, that would suggest that it's permanent. But that's not the biblical concept. The biblical concept is it's an intruder, and that ultimately God will restore a world that will be appreciated, perhaps even more, because of what we know the alternative is. So if there's one good thing coming out of sin and suffering and evil, is that in the long run, we may appreciate the good a bit more simply because we have something to compare it to that we might not otherwise have. But I don't think from the biblical perspective that sin was ever necessary. It was a choice. Gail. Just on the question of defining love, the Bible says it's easy for the lovable to be loved. It's easy for us to love those who love us. I think the challenge is from a Christian, how do you love those who are not showing love back? And I think it's a question that we can struggle with because even as I think about how Christ responds to us, we're talking about why God died for us and he gave it all. But even I think God has limits. A time will come when he will say no more. So I don't have the answer for that. Maybe someone else does. But I think there there has to be a limit. I'm not sure. I think that's the struggle the limit of being loved in the context of our brokenness and in a broken world. Well, the text that comes to mind from what you're saying and also what Sherry said earlier is Matthew 5, where it says that God reigns and shines the sun on the just and the unjust, that God is willing to benefit all. But the problem with sin is when it sets us in rebellion against God, it hinders God from expressing the love that he would wish to express to us. It frustrates God's ability to truly bless us. And you see that also in Deuteronomy, where God says, if you work with this covenant, all these good things are going to happen. If you reject it and turn your face away from me, then worse and worse things are going to happen. And that's sort of a law of the universe, that life is found with God. And God desires to pour out his riches upon us, but we often get in the way. Sean. Some years ago, I was invited to speak at a community church here where I live, and I gladly did that. We had a nice service. It was on Sunday. I didn't know the members that well. I knew some of them. And as is the custom, after I spoke, I headed down the aisle. And This particular church had a nice set of stairs out front that led to the walkway in front of the street. And so I walked down there and waited for members to come out as they were filing out of the church. And I was standing on the sidewalk and out shoots the son, five-year-old son of the resident pastor and his wife. And he shot down the steps and he was going to run past me across the sidewalk in between two vehicles. And I happened to notice out of the side of my eye that there was a vehicle coming down the street. So my immediate reaction was I stuck out my leg and the five-year-old boy slammed into my leg and he fell down onto the sidewalk. He began crying immediately. And the pastor's wife, not knowing what was going on, was very, very upset with me to see her son crying on the sidewalk. She came down out of great misunderstanding and began to address me in such a way that was difficult for people around us even to hear and to understand until it was explained to her why I had done what I had done. Because the little boy was intending to run through the two parked cars across the road to the vehicle that they owned. That was his mom and dad's vehicle. He was going to run directly across right into the path of an oncoming vehicle. I say that based on your using the parenting model as a way to attempt to begin to understand how God would display himself in ways that we interpret as wrathful or difficult to understand as a means to protect and do the best that he can do in any circumstance to redeem and help any given person in any given situation. After some time of explanation, both the mother and the son were reunited and comforted to know that 
I had saved his life, likely. And so in this understanding of wrath, God's wrath, he is intending and attempting to save our life in every way possible. Thank you. Good illustration. Let's go to number seven and continue with 1 John 4, because it's one of the less known or appreciated love texts in the Bible. And let's take a couple of minutes to look at it more carefully. Terry, if you would, let's go to 1 John 4, and we'll go all the way to 16. But for right now, let's just read verse 9. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Okay, I think that's a fairly straightforward text, but it's basically saying that God's love was expressed to us when he sent Jesus. There was the incarnation of Jesus. His birth as a baby was God's gift to us, a gift of love. But he goes on, verse 10. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. All right. So here it tells us, first of all, that God's love is prior to our love. It's not that we loved God first, but that he loved us first. All right, so God's love precedes our love. And what God did in sending Jesus was an expression of his love that was there beforehand. And in this verse, it also indicates that the cross, the act of Christ on the cross, was an expression of God's love. So he expands in verse 10 on the incarnation idea that God sent Jesus as a gift of love, expands that and says, in particular, the cross was how God expressed his love. But it is God that took the initiative. Verse 11. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. All right. So it tells us not only that God's love is prior, It also tells us that God's love precipitates our love to the degree that we can taste and experience God's love toward us. Our capacity to love others increases. So it's critical not that we just, you know, we listen to this and say, okay, I got to go out and love people the way God does. It is out of opening ourselves to God's love, receiving it, tasting it, experiencing it. That is the context in which we more and more become like that. So God's love precipitates our love in return. Verse 12. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. Okay, now we get to an interesting and dangerous concept, exciting concept as well. It says no one's ever seen God. How do you love someone you can't see, hear, or touch? Think about that. No one has ever seen God. So how do you love God whom you've not seen, heard, or touched? And the author's answer is, we return our love to God by the love we show to others. Or as he says later in the chapter, the one who says, I love God but hates his brother, doesn't know God. All right? So... The way that we show our love for God is how we love others. God receives it. And, you know, you have that Matthew 25. You've done it to one of the least of these. You've done it unto me. It follows the same uh, track of thinking. Because God is not immediately accessible to us, God accepts our love to him through our behavior toward others. Gary? I guess it depends upon your definition of see or seen. If we're talking about visual sight, then I guess we can say, yes, we haven't seen God. But even Jesus talks about how we didn't see the wind, but we see its effect. The wind can have a significant effect upon lots of things. So to say that we don't see God, I have a little problem with that. I think that was part of the whole Bible is how is God interacting with humankind and the universe? And that to me is seeing God. Well, we know that we can have a living relationship with God even if we don't see him physically. And that's, I think, what the author is saying here. Even though we don't see him, don't touch him physically, 
et cetera, et cetera. We can have a living relationship with him, but God accepts our love for others, our actions of love as if done to himself. And that's the most tangible way in which we can love God back, I think. Henry. Besides, and adding to what Gary just mentioned, I think that when Jesus was saying that nobody has seen God, he wasn't saying necessarily that it is impossible to see him, but that we have not been able to see him because they were seeing him physically and they were confusing him with a demonic. So I think that what Jesus was trying to say is nobody has seen God, or when John was saying nobody has seen God is because even if we will have him in front of us, we will not recognize him because we are not, our minds are not grappled on the concept, the real concept of what he is. And we have not been able to see him, even though he's trying to show who he is to us. And the beauty of that is that that's not the final period on the history. Finally, he tells to Philip, when he is asking, show us the father and say, hey, I have been with all of this time and you still have not known him. If you can see me, you have seen the father. So even that disciple, even having him in front of him and demonstrated by the life of Jesus was not able to see him. And that's what Jesus is calling. Nobody has seen him because our blinders are not letting us see him. Yeah, the context of the verse in John 1, no one has seen God, is in the context of Moses, where Moses went on the mountain and was in the presence of God, but he was not allowed to see God's face, as that would have been evidently too much for him. So his vision of God was a limited one. And the point is that in Jesus, we have the presence of God in a tangible way visible way, such as Moses did not, and the people of Israel did not have in Old Testament times. You want to follow up, Henry? I will, <laughs> yeah. because how can you speak face to face like a friend, as the Bible described it, without seeing him? That's one way. And even the people say to Moses, now we have seen that it's possible to see and to talk God for a human being and not dying. So those Concepts are a little bit contradictory if we want, but I think they're worth to come to an understanding. I truly believe that it's possible to see him because there is nothing harming about God. God has no problem with us, with our sinful nature. God went after Adam in the Garden of Eden, walking into the garden after sin. And the only one that was afraid to see him was Adam, not God trying to be a threat for him. I think we're defining seeing a little bit differently. And I think both aspects are correct in their own sense. But I think what these texts are saying is that human beings, because of their own limitations, tend to uh, love needs to be expressed in tangible ways and experienced in tangible ways. And one reason for Jesus to come in person was that we could see him literally, physically, in a way that we could not in Old Testament times. At the same time, we can express our love to God tangibly in our relationship to others in ways that we would not otherwise be able to do. Melissa? We belonged to a church a long time ago in Rochester, and that's where I thought, not I thought, I know that I saw God. And I saw him specifically in a couple of people I would call saints now. And I never thought in my lifetime until that point that I would really meet a saint. But I met saints at that church who reflected God's character so perfectly that I could say that I had met a saint and I, that I had seen God through these two living individuals. So I think it's possible. Maybe not to see the God that Moses wanted to see, but I think Jesus is reflected, can be reflected fairly, perfectly in some individuals, and I've had the great privilege of knowing a couple of them. Well, it's interesting. In John 1, he says, no one has seen God, 
but the unique one who is in the bosom of the Father has exegeted him. So he's drawing a distinction. And based on our conversation, I'd say it's a distinction between two types of seeing. There's the physical, literal seeing of God the Father. On the other hand, Jesus, in the person of Jesus, is an exegesis of God the Father. It's real. It's a real seeing. It's a real tangible revelation of God. But at the same time, it isn't seeing in the simple physical sense. He's drawing a distinction. Again, you know, words draw their limits sometimes in these kind of conversations. I think points are made both ways. Verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. All right. So how do we know that we are in relationship with God? How do we know that we live in him and he is living in us? And according to this text, the evidence is in the presence of the Spirit. So that, <laughs> that moves the question one step further. How do you know that the Spirit is in you? So it's answering the one with the other. You know that God is in you if you have the Spirit. Well, how do you know you have the Spirit in you? And the answer, I think, would be the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, etc. As these spiritual qualities become more and more manifest in us, they are evidence of our relationship with God. Now, verses 14 to 16, I think, elaborates on that. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. So love, then, is the evidence of our relationship with God. It's the evidence that God is real in our lives, the way that we treat others. The other-centeredness of our life, that is evident. It's a miracle. It isn't something one can you know, wake up one day and say, I'm going to do more of that. No, it's something that happens gradually as we walk with God. We become more and more like that. And the love, the way we treat others, is the evidence that our relationship with God is real. And so here in 1 John, it's both helping to define God's love, but also define our love for one another. Bobby Joe. The word abide used in that verse that we're to abide in love, what exactly does that mean? It says, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Is abiding in love basically staying in a posture of receiving and giving love? That comes from the Greek word meno, and we have the word remain, which comes close into that it's the idea of continuing in relationship, continuing in being with someone else. Jesus says, remain in me, and I will remain in you. That's a very common word in especially the last part of the Gospel of John. So I think the, the key with relationship is continuity. When you don't have contact with a person for three, four years, the relationship's still there, but it's probably not growing not at the level where it could be if you were continually in connection with each other. A little question there in number seven. It says, what kind of decision-making process can help avoid the negative consequences of choices we have made in the past? I drew that from the lesson, and now it's sounding almost a bit out of left field in a way, but something to think about. In another series, the stages of surrender, there was the idea there are some things that we can do to allow God's love to be perceived by us and to flow through us to others, stages of surrender. So be thinking about that and welcome thoughts on that before we conclude. Obviously, the lesson goes to the standard text, Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, Revelation 12, and could throw out the broader question, what do these texts tell us about the cosmic conflict? What do they tell us about the origin of sin? What do they tell us about God? As you think upon Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, 
Revelation 12. Does anyone have some thoughts they're ready to share? If not, Terry, why don't you go ahead and read Ezekiel 28, 12 to 17, and we'll just reflect on that. Mortal, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, carnelian, chrysolite, and moonstone, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald, and worked in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. With an anointed cherub as guardian, I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God and the guardian cherub drove you out from among the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. By the multitude of your iniquities, in the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. So I brought out fire from within you. It consumed you, and I turned you to ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have come to a dreadful end and shall be no more forever. All right, so Ezekiel 28 tells us a number of things. It tells us that God did not create sin. The original creation, even of Lucifer, was free of any defect, but that God did create a creation that had the potential for evil because of freedom, that in giving people freedom, which is necessary to love, if God is love, then creating beings that are able to love is critical, and to be able to love means also to be able to say no to love. Satan's method of operation here is slander, telling lies about God and about others. And an interesting thing in verse 17, it says his thinking processes were distorted, that something happens with sin that you don't think straight anymore. And the process of a series of studies like this is exposing our own distorted thinking on the basis of Scripture. So sin distorts the way we think. We we should not assume that whatever way we think is right is automatically going to be right. A question for you in the light of that. If God knew Lucifer would cause all this trouble, why did he create him? Wouldn't it have been simple to simply say, okay, we're not going to create that one? Daniel. But that would be manipulation, and God would not be able to live with himself. I like that point that you made. God would not be able to live with himself. Yeah. You see, people often accuse God that uh, the Bible was written, you know, anybody's uh, sneaked in whatever they wanted. But evil, or the greatest argument from the existence of evil is that God is so committed to the truth, whatever the cost it brings. Otherwise, he would not be able to live with himself. He is not going to manipulate the evidence. You know, I think often we talk about the law of God, that the law of God must rule, you know, and guide and so on. But ultimately, the law of God is that it's ideal an expression of God's character and God's integrity. There are things you could do and no one ever find out about, but you would know. And God's integrity is such that he respects his own future, you could say, by uh, maintaining his integrity in all things. Bob? But God probably did not create Lucifer preordained to sin. He probably left him a free choice, so he could sin or not sin. If we go by that, God wouldn't create Lucifer to sin any more than he would create us to sin. Fair enough? He created Lucifer perfect, but he also created him free. That's right. Michael? Well, we know that God is perfect, and therefore, God doesn't need us. We need God. And the same with 
Why did he create it? It was an act of love, and that's the same with the creation of Lucifer. It was an act of love on God's part. And the fact that Lucifer rejected that love doesn't change the fact that in the first instance, it was God's love that brought about the creation of everything, including us. All right. Thank you. Henry? I think that one more reason is that God never had a problem with Lucifer. The problem was with sin. And sin could have popped up with anybody. So for God to start shutting down one potential, he needed to shut down every single creature because all of them were granted with freedom. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if Lucifer had never sinned, that would have been great. And God had a plan for a universe that would flow freely forward, uh, growing in maturity, growing in appreciation of God, growing in appreciation of the good things of the universe. But if sin did happen, God knew what he would do about it. And so God did not enter into this process without considering the possibility, the risk that was involved and what he would do if necessary. John. Perhaps God seeing the end from the beginning is of the opinion that the end will be well worth the beginning. In the end, it will be worth going through the great controversy. And that ultimately, I think, is core to our attitude. Is it going to be worth it? And that's something we have to trust. We cannot absolutely know that. But it's something we have to trust that when God is done, we'll be glad and say, you know, it was worth it all. Our time is up. Let me draw a few things to a conclusion, because the question I was asking myself at this point is, in what ways does this cosmic conflict matter in today's world? In what ways does it impact the way we think about current events and so on? And one thing that has really impacted me as someone who's spent a lot of time more recently interacting with non-Christian religions, is the realization that if the cosmic conflict is true, if the entire universe is in a war over the character and government of God, then that means that God is at work in every place, and that Satan is at work in every place. And so I have to come to realize God is at work in every religion. The Holy Spirit was there before any of us interacted with that particular group or that particular religion. But Satan is also at work. And so we find ourselves in a world of ambiguity because the cosmic conflict is constantly in play. And it seems to me, and, and what I've presented often to people of other faiths, is that the most important concept is the character of God, the picture of God. That's the issue in the final crisis. And a religion is successful to the degree that it illustrates a beautiful character of God. And I wish I could say that Christianity does a better job of that than all other religions. And I wish I could say that among Christians, Adventists do a better job of that than all others. I don't know if one can say either of those, because I've met some amazingly gracious, kind people who are inspired by their view of God to treat others in the ways we studied in this lesson. So I'm learning with cosmic conflict that God is at work in places we would not expect to find him. That as has been said here, he shines and rains on the just and the unjust. God is at work in every place without partiality. But Satan is also at work. That's true also in the political realm. God is at work in every political party. And that Satan is also at work in every political party. This conflict is truly universal. And so it teaches us where our ultimate loyalties lie. And finally, the cosmic conflict tells me that the line between good and evil doesn't run between us and them. The line between good and evil runs right down the middle of our hearts. The God is at work in your life and mine, and so is Satan at work. So let's encourage each other to keep our focus and our attention on the one who desires our best good. Let's pray. I thank you, Lord, for this lesson, a reminder of things we have often studied before in this class, but a reminder of the cosmic conflict, its central theme being the character and love that you have expressed toward us. 
through Jesus Christ. And I pray that as we continue to meditate on these important things, that you would continue to be available to us. Though we do not see you in the ocular sense, we see you in even more meaningful ways every day in relationship. We thank you for that, and we pray that you would help us to see each person that we meet as someone that we can show our love to you, too, in tangible, visible, everyday ways. We invite your presence to that end, for Jesus' sake. Amen.